Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's good to see you up there. Would the sponsor yield? Will you yield? Yes, Andrew. Um, Mr. Lentil, as I understand this bill, we expand the definition of assault weapons, but we allow everyone who has a weapon that today is legal, but tomorrow would be defined as an assault weapon, to keep that weapon. Is that correct? That's correct. There's no confiscation. None. There's no buyback. There's no elimination of these guns. That's correct. So all these guns that we that this bill would make illegal today will still be out in the public tomorrow, correct? Well, what would be illegal is if the person who has a right to have the gun and registers it tries to sell it to somebody in New York. But he has a year a he has a year to register it. So right. between this morning when I got up and all these guns were legal and if this passes tomorrow when they're all illegal, all these guns covered by this, they're still out there, right? That's right. So why was this such a necessity that we adopt this legislation today and that we not get the legislation? I didn't get a copy of it till nearly midnight. What is the emergency that changes this whole dynamic? I think the emergency exists in beginning to register these weapons so that we have a handle on them. And so if we waited something. till Friday to register them, there would be some sort of catastrophic event other than the fact that the federal no. government might beat us to this registration requirement? No, I think, the, I think the haste is the faster we get it, hopefully the faster we can prevent other crimes. Is there any emergent situation though between today, Tuesday, and Thursday or Friday of this week that would have enabled us time to get copies of this legislation out to our constituents and to reach out to uh, affected groups and get their advice and counsel? I don't think we know the answer to that question. All I can tell you is that it would be a tragedy, wouldn't it, if we waited till next week to do it and we had a shooting in a school by somebody who owned a, a banned assault rifle? Indeed, I think it would be a tragedy, and of course, this legislation wouldn't prevent that, would it? Because all those guns are still going to be out there on the street tomorrow, right? True, but we have, we have at least a, a registration of those who have the weapons so that we can check to determine whether or not they have disqualified themselves from having the weapon because of <laughs> mental as, incapacity or other... But as factors. we noted, that they have a year to do that registration. That's right. Right. So, so the longer we wait the longer we don't get the information. Ah, so we're really concerned about that time period between January 15, 2014 and January 17, 2014, right? That, okay. that extra three days at the end of the one-year registration. I'm sorry, Carl. I think that's, that's, a fair assessment. that's a fair assessment. Uh, I don't want to wait more than a couple of days, but, you know, we have to, we have to give some lead time in the law, and we understand that. Um, we've talked a little bit about the uh, data from the DCJS, the Department of Criminal Justice Services, that indicate that in 2011, five people were killed with a rifle. Do you know how many of those five murders with a rifle involved an assault weapon? I don't know. I'm sorry. Uh, the data from DCJS also indicated that there were... Uh, 393 murders with a handgun. Do you know how many of those handguns would be affected by this ban? I don't know. The governor mentioned in, uh, I believe in the state of the state message, that he thought there were a million people that owned these kinds of guns. Is that the number that you're familiar yes. with? It's as well, I, think, uh, I don't think he came up with that number out of the air. I think the uh, state police and DCJS probably gave him the best information they have at their disposal now. So you think a million is a reasonable estimate of how many guns with owners that will be affected by this legislation? I'll take him at his word. I, I would as well. If, if we have a million of these gun owners out there with these, with these guns, but only five murders were committed last year, Statistically, aren't these guns much, much safer than cars or motorcycles or bicycles? We registered them too. 
Well, we haven't registered bicycles yet. That was so. proposed last year, but we didn't go forward with it. But I mean, statistically, that's a very, very small number of deaths with a million of these owners out there, isn't it? As far as I'm concerned, one death is too many. Well, I would agree. And, and you know, last week or a few weeks ago, we saw uh, repeated news coverage of, of people who were killed by subways in New York City, as you know. And those are tragedies, too. I mean, innocent people pushed uh, on the tracks by someone who is not mentally stable. And in fact, Kendra's Law was named after that kind of situation, right? Yes, it was. As you know, the New York Times reported that 55 people were killed by subways in New York City last year. 11 times more people were killed by subways than by a rifle. Hmm? That would suggest that subways are a lot more dangerous than rifles. I still, I still have no problem using a subway, though. I have a problem with somebody coming down the street with an assault weapon, though. Well, and I agree, you know, and we're all concerned about that. If this legislation were in effect, say, a month ago, would it have prevented what happened at Webster? At where? At Webster. Webster. Uh, no, I don't think so. Do you think uh, if this legislation were in effect here in New York State a month ago, it would have prevented what happened in Sandy Hook, Connecticut? No. As you know, the Columbine uh, uh, tragedy, which was a horrific tragedy, of course, that occurred... I mean, let me just, uh, let me amend that statement, because Sandy Hook could have been prevented if, uh, you know, the parent was the one who owned the weapons. Well, the, and, the, and parent, the, parent, did, the, the parent did own the weapons yes, in Sandy Hook. Yes, the parent owned the weapons, and under the safe storage provision of this bill, it might have been locked up as a result of, uh, you know, if the child had disability, uh, mental disability issues that were known to the parent, there might have been a requirement for the, that weapon to be locked up. Well, as you know, the safe storage provisions under this bill aren't triggered by a parent knowing that their child is has mental issues. It's triggered by very specific criteria, right? Yeah, that's right. Institutionalized. None of those criteria applied in Sandy Hook, did they? That's true. So I said maybe. Okay. There was a possibility that, uh, you know, maybe there are things that we yet don't know about. Now, the Senator, child, Senator Gillibrand was quoted a few weeks ago saying that, uh, according to FBI statistics, 90% of the guns recovered in New York City in crime scenes came from outside of New York State and 70% upstate. Is that, is that your understanding as yeah. well? So what we're talking about is dealing with five rifles, of which statistically four of them would have come from outside the state anyway. So we're talking about maybe dealing with one murder. Where this they... is the necessity that causes us to get bills at midnight. I'm sorry, I apologize. All right, you know, there, there are a lot of unsolved killings that we don't know uh, how they occurred. Can I ask uh, some questions uh, on bought. specific language, if I, if I may? Sure. Uh, let's look at page 18, which is the definition of assault weapon. Page 18. This is 18, page 18 of the bill. Um, obviously, uh, for a rifle, it has to be a semi-automatic, and then it has to have something else, uh, yes. such as an adjustable stock. To be honest with you, I, I didn't quite understand why does an adjustable stock make a semi-automatic rifle more dangerous? The answer, the answer is the one I gave before, because the state police says that it does. Well, you, as you know, you can buy multiple sizes of stocks, right? Whatever you want to buy. Uh, but some people prefer an adjustable stock so that they can use it and they can go out with their son or their daughter and they can adjust the stock rather than take the gun apart. Why would an adjustable stock make a rifle more dangerous. Yeah. All I can tell you is that the uh, the reason that this was done because we relied upon the expertise of the state police. And that that applies as well to a thumb hole stock. I mean, a hole in the stock makes it now all an assault weapon. All of the features were provided by them. We didn't create this in a vacuum. Okay. Well, that's fair enough. Now, if you have one of the weapons which you bought today lawfully, legally here in New York State. 
and is outlawed, say, tomorrow by this bill. Am I correct that you cannot transfer it to anyone in New York State other than a licensed gun dealer? Yes. What happens when you die? Now you're a grieving widow or widower, assuming that they didn't kill you with it, but uh, now your estate owns these guns. What does the estate do? I think that uh, the administrator or the executor of the estate would have the power to sell that weapon to somebody out of state. So we are exporting what we consider to be dangerous weapons to other states, our neighboring states like Connecticut, for example? Not we, the administrator. The administrator. So it's okay for the administrator then to sell this to, you know, some uh, somebody else in Connecticut or or Colorado or somewhere outside the state. That's our solution. But would you support an absolute ban? This is uh, not at all. I, I favor the Second Amendment. I'm just trying to figure out how this would work. How long does the estate have to sell? I mean, I'm just trying to devise ways for you as to what would happen to that weapon or what could be, uh, you know, reasonably done with it by the uh, widower and through, through the administration of the estate. Right, I'm just quite... Because it could be destroyed. And... But you can't just give it to your son, can you? No. That would be illegal. Even though your son could use it lawfully well, as long as you were alive, is that correct? It held by law enforcement for one year. I'm told it would be held by law enforcement for one year. And at the one year, it would be confiscated? Could be sold. If it's, so, if it's not sold during the year, it would be destroyed. And does the estate uh, get any reimbursement for the value of this weapon that is destroyed? No. Now, am I correct that the day before you die, you could go hunting with your son or daughter and they could use this weapon lawfully in the United States, in New York State, rather? Say that again. Am I correct that if you lawfully own these guns, you can go hunting or target shooting with your son or daughter as long as you are alive? Yes. But if you die, then they can't even hold, own them? Right. All right. It just seems a little strange to me. Can you help me a little bit understand some of this mental health uh, issues? And I agree with a lot of my colleagues, and I agree with you, Joe, that mental health issues are very important. Yeah. I'm just trying to understand quite how this law works. I could try, but I might defer to Mr. Ortiz, who's the expert. But you can ask me the question. It's always great to have other experts. <laughs> Look at them. Um, as you know, sometimes you can have a mental health issue that's temporary in nature. I mean, you might have a head injury, for example, not be able to handle your own affairs, maybe even be unconscious, and then recover. Yes. If you need a committee to handle your financial affairs while you're recovering, this law, am I correct, on page 26, makes it impossible for you to keep your guns in the meantime? Yes. And is that a temporary disability because your license is revoked or suspended? Is it just a temporary revocation? Yes, it is. And so you can, you can, when you regain consciousness, you can apply to get your guns back? Yes. And in the meantime, who holds your guns? Hopefully it's kept in uh, safe storage. But uh, where would the guns go? Law enforcement would probably have the gun. I see also, by the way, that uh, any addiction to a controlled substance is a uh, criteria that results in the loss of your license, correct? Yes. Federal law. And so that, it's new in our statute, but you're saying it's not new under federal law. That's right. So we're just bringing our statute in conform conformity. Conforming it with the federal law. Okay. I had a question on a couple of sections that I was hoping you could help clarify it. On page 22, which is relating to the penalties, it states that a person who knowingly fails to register a firearm would be guilty of criminal possession of a firearm as a Class E felony. Is that correct? Am I reading that correctly? Yes, you are. So, if I'm reading this, if I understand this correctly, we have about a million gun owners out there right now who followed every rule in the book, bought lawful life, uh, rifles, 
And if they don't register within a year, they could be guilty of a Class E felony? Yes. 30 day one. <laughs> Mr. Lendl, thank you very much. The 30 day cure period, however, for innocent failure to register, unknowingly. What a great thing. We have 30 days to cure before you have but a class not, If you didn't know what the law was, you'd have 30 days to cure. You have a year first, and then you have a 30-day cure period after you uh, determined, it was determined that you didn't know, and you could cure it within 30 days, and then you wouldn't be guilty of any crime. Thank you, Mr. Lentil. Thank you, Mr. Goodell. Mr.